days or something. <laughs> <laughs> the box. And in fact, that's what I want, I'm in fact, trying to talk about. Really the importance of attention localization okay. and source separation to speech cognition and recall. Okay, we've been hearing a lot, as I said at the little introduction to the session, about speech masking by noise of various kinds. And I would point out that this room is exceptionally quiet, except when somebody opens the door. Okay? And if I turn off the microphone, the question is, is that any different from intelligibility, or, um, or is it the same, or is it better? And I think there's actually some evidence that over-amplifying something too loud actually uh, is not beneficial in some uh, circumstances. For example, um, if acoustics are not great in the back and I'm speaking loud, people will start talking to each other. Whereas if I talk in clear speech but at a local level, they won't because they would annoy their neighbors. Okay, so, and your mother probably told you that, uh, or demonstrated to you that if they really want you to pay attention, you speak quietly and very clearly. Okay. And that causes so, um, acoustics. I'm wanting to talk about acoustic effects. I'm very happy for Pavel, who was talking about acoustic effects and the other speakers. Um, but I think speech comprehension has been intensely studied with noise masking and reverberation. By reverberation, I mean that reflections that come relatively late after the onset of the speech sound and tend to mask the onset of a succeeding speech sound. And these, uh, this effect has been measured for a long time with STI, and it works actually rather well. So I'm not going to talk about that, except in passing. Um, but I would like to focus on a third and largely forgotten acoustic factor in speech and music comprehension, and that is early reflections. Okay, early reflections in the current acoustic canon are all assumed to be beneficial. Everybody needs as many early reflections as possible. Um, according to current acoustic canon. Um, and people are always quoting Haas to say that when a reflection comes within 50 milliseconds of the direct sound, it blends with the, uh, the, uh, the direct sound and becomes indetectable and it raises the level, so that's a good thing. In fact, that's not true. Um, when reflections come uh, in the first 50 milliseconds, they change the sound dramatically. I will demonstrate that with the mic here. Um, it's deliberately made, I deliberately set the mic so I was very close to the speaker. But if I change the speaker so I come from over there, what you hear in the room is actually quite different than what happens if I do this. And the reason is, that becomes an early reflection. Okay? And it's very early, but it's very detrimental. Um, and when I turn the, speak, the thing off, if I can speak that way, it works even better than that. Um, there's, there's important things for that. Excessive early reflections inhibit both word recognition and recall, even when intelligibility is high. They add loudness, but they add a muddiness to the sound that inhibits comprehension and reduces attention. That's my, that's my thesis. Now, I'm saying this here because I want you guys to study it. I don't have graphs of students, OK? And all I can do is say, you know, these things exist. We should be looking at them. You guys can do it. I hope you will. Now, here's a demonstration that many of you have heard before. Um, this is a sentence you'll, it, it self describes what it is. Oh, well, I should, I will describe it. Here is an impulse response. <laughs> this is an impulse response which has an STI of infinity, well, STI 0.96, at C50, C80 are infinity, and that means that this, uh, this, uh, impulse response should be beneficial or should cause no damage, right? Okay, that's, that's current acoustic theory. I'll play it here. The first half of this sentence has no impulse response, the second half does. Come on. If I record my voice with a microphone close to my mouth, the sound is very close to the ear of the listener, present, very clear. However, if I scramble the harmonics above 1,000 hertz, the sound is very different. It might be perceived as distant or muddy. Now, I would propose that that's harder to hear, okay? And you could make an experiment with that kind of uh, source degradation that would actually prove that it's harder to hear. And it might need to be uh, harder to remember, uh, which is very important and really what I'm interested in. Because I think the difference between intelligibility and what you can recall later is actually very large. It depends on a lot of factors, 
many of which you guys know. Okay. Intelligent noise is not the same as recall. Lots of people have looked at, at masking and noise, but the bottom line is recall requires a higher standard of acoustics than just STI. And attention is perhaps the most important part. But fortunately, in this particular environment, you're probably all paying attention, okay? Uh, it's, it's, it's why you're here. But in many other uh, environments, attention is not necessarily guaranteed. And my, my conjecture is, and again, I'd love you guys to prove it, is that when you speak clearly like this, with clear acoustics, then attention is held. Now, how do we know that? Um, well, first of all, let's make, I'm going to describe a little experiment. Carl Wyman, who's sort of a friend of a friend of mine, uh, and, and a Nobel Prize winning physicist, and Catherine Perkins, who's a graduate student, assigned college static students randomly at this University of Colorado to seats in a large classroom for the physics of everyday life. And they were uh, divided into four groups based on distance to the teacher. So this is a random assignment of teachers to distance from the teacher. So students to, from the teacher. And this is a modern class so they could track class participation with clickers and all that. And they had many uh, quizzes all the time. Uh, and at the semester break, the seat positions were switched. And the ones in front went in back and the back went in front. And unfortunately, the differences were preserved. And these results are absolutely alarming. I don't have time to discuss them. But uh, the difference between the people who sat in front and the people who sat in back was a full grade level and a great difference in participation and in final outcomes, which is very scary, actually. Um, and the, it was a good classroom. The, the intelligibility everywhere was good, as measured by STI. So I made some vinyl recordings in a similar classroom at Harvard, and I can play them for you. Um, here is the sound uh, from the teacher in speaking to an empty classroom from the front of the hall with no microphone. If you have non if you have non-polar molecules like oils, yeah. then the dielectric constant, the static dielectric constant and the refractive index do correlate. So that's great, right? That's perfect. And here's in the back of the hall with the microphone. Okay, so next week we're gonna be doing Gauss's Law. Uh, the introduction of Gauss's Law will be uh, based a lot on looking at symmetry. We'll deal with high symmetry situations, spherical symmetry, planar symmetry. There were some people talking in there during this experiment, so that's what you're hearing. It isn't, it isn't the, the, the room. And here um, is, during the lecture, with, with this PA system, there's a large uh, cellular home up, up here with a PA system running, very high intelligibility measured by STI. This is the sound that you're getting. Even though the whole molecule is like the neutral, very important water has a separated distribution, finally built it. The background noise is all the students talking to each other and playing with their cell phones. Okay? They're not listening. Why are they not listening? Because it's so loud. And I gave these results to him. And he now, he's turned the microphone way down. It only gets a little bit of lift in the back. And he says things are much better. Okay. So less volume, less amplification, better results. I'm going to skip all this so we don't have time. I have examples from the arts of many venues where, where clear sound is, is, is important. In, in Epidurus, uh, 15,000 people, you get people way up here, way away from the speaker, get perfect speech clarity. Doesn't matter how loud it is because it's quiet and their hearing hasn't been damaged, unlike ours. Okay, how do we duplicate this inside a room? Again, I won't go into this. I'm going to talk about this one, however, because this is really key to my understanding of this problem. We were asked to improve the loudness and intelligibility of the, of the actors in this venue. It was a, a checkoff they were doing. And I put 64 speakers all around the audience area here and, and made a complicated uh, system that, that put speech in them from line array microphones uh, very close to on these balcony rails here, very far from the state. Anyway, they, like, they, they, the, the, the opinion of the, of the five major drama directors in Copenhagen at the time said, it works, we don't like it. The system increases the distance we perceive between the actors and the audience. Distance. We would rather the audience did not hear the words than this connection is broken. If they can't quite hear the words, they will pay more attention. And that's just what we want. Okay, that's five drama directors 
unanimous on saying sonic distance is critical to what they do. All right, here's another thing I'm going to say. Wagner is interesting, but I don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Bach's box, Tomaschiopin box, in, in Leipzig was festooned with banners during the past time. And Marshall Long indicates that 1.6 seconds reverb time for a cathedral that's absolutely huge, which means it's basically dry in there. And you could actually do the bathroom passion in there and hear every word. Okay, well, but he did it. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> Uh, so what about cinemas? Well, I don't know if you're familiar with the voice of the theater speaker, but man, that's a great speaker. It was designed in the 30s. You have this big horn up here, beautiful face linearity over the vocal formant range, and, and high directivity. So um, this produces dialogue from the center of the stage for every movie from the 1930s to, well, maybe the 1970s when they started replacing them, which I think was a mistake. <coughs> How can we predict when a sound will be perceived as close? The point is that humans can distinguish that in, in a tenth of a second. Okay. The difference between that muddled sound I played you and the clear sound is instantaneous, almost, within a syllable. No current, no current hearing a model can explain that effect. Um, and that's not all. No current hearing a model can duplicate our abilities to understand speech in noisy environments. And I think a lot of the people in this room know that. Okay. And if you use your cell phone to ask for a restaurant, you know you've got to hold it close. Because if you hold it over here, Sirius doesn't, can't hear you at all. Just lots of errors. That's because hearing models can't do this. Well, why did it fail? That's because direct sound, when it has these little spikes, this is called the fine structure. And Pavel knows all about it, <laughs> unfortunately. And you see this fine structure in the amplitude of speech. And if you put reflections in it, this is what you get. It's noise. Okay. And the ear can detect those spikes. And when they're there, it says it's close. When they're not, it's far. Okay. Well, the mechanism for perceiving that was proposed by J.C.R. Wickelbiter in 1951. And it's been very strongly ignored ever since. Although, when Chris Blair, who was here, took uh, acoustics, apparently, from Richard Bolt, um, they mentioned it because the, at that time, there was the idea of a, of a place sense of pitch, which is on the vast membrane. And then this autocorrelator gives you a period-based sense of pitch. Okay. And, and that, that simulator's contribution. And this absolutely duplicates. I, I built this model myself about 10 years ago. And I've been trying to get people to believe it. And so two years ago, I found out the glider had predicted it in 1954. And I'll just demonstrate that. Here is this little one voice in the whisper. Here's the, that same signal in noise. Um, I don't have time to talk about the order or program of Courtney too much, but the important part here is the spiral ganglia. There's 3,000 inner hair cells, and those are the ones that detect sound. There's somewhere between 30,000 and 60,000 spiral ganglia. And you ask the question, what are they doing? Okay, you would only need one per, per inner hair cell if you wanted to just send the signals up to the auditory nerve. But there's a factor of either 20 or 10 more, and they must be doing something. And it's clear, to me anyway, that what we're doing is this. And actually, Jens Blauer um, told me uh, in, that, uh, pointed out to me that the blast memory is a delay line. You want to make an autocorrelator, you just have to connect dendrites from one spiral ganglia to a, not adjacent hair cells, but ones at some distance. You've got a comb filter, you've got an autocorrelator. Okay, anyway. So how do we measure this? Well, I made a measure called LOC, L-O-C, which predicts lo ability to localize in a reverberant field. And I matched the measure to some measured data. I don't have time to talk about it, but it's a pretty good match. And I don't talk about this. The picture that we use to show the effects of LOC looks like this, and I was very honored that Leo Brannick put my picture in his talk on Tuesday. Um, Leo is a very strong believer in this as well as Jens Flower, but it's a hard sell outside of that company. Um, anyway, what about classrooms? I find the hit classrooms. How am I doing, really? Oh, just five minutes, okay. Um, I'm not going to be much questions, but the question is, I've studied this in large groups. The question is, does it apply 
to classrooms? And the answer is yes, it actually does. Um, so I made an image source model of the classrooms, and I can play some images from this. This is a classroom I, I decided, okay, we'll make it 27 feet long and 25 feet wide, okay? And uh, the teacher's gonna be at six feet from the blackboard, okay? And there's gonna be these five listening positions. And I can, I can measure uh, what the intelligibility is, and I can measure my LOC measure. And you can see that the, top, the STI is almost constant. And that's because SDI is, is dominated by the reverberation time, the late reverberation time. That's what it measures. But this clarity changes enormously. Okay, I think I can play that. We'll see. I hope this works. <laughs> to be suitable to the needs of modern concert music, a hall must accommodate a great variety of styles. Music of the transparent. Okay, that's close. Okay, the next one is here. To be suitable to the needs of modern concert music, a hall must accommodate a great variety of... Okay, it's getting fuzzier. We'll go back to here, and that, that'll be the last one I'll play. To be suitable to the needs of modern concert music, a hall must accommodate a great variety of styles. Okay, that's that's really fuzzy. I'll go back and play the first one just so you can be sure that you hear it. To be suitable to the needs of modern concert music, a hall must accommodate a great variety of styles. Okay, well anyway, on headphones that's very realistic. Maybe it doesn't work all that well. Uh, what can be done? Well, it turns out I, in concert halls, just, re just reducing the back wall reflection frequently makes a difference between clear and, and muddy. I think uh, Chris can talk to that, but he's my phone. Um, right now, anyway. <laughs> but in this room it didn't help very much, so I found I really had to decrease, I had to increase the absorption in the room to make it work, and then you, I won't play this, but you can see now the LOCs are all above zero. And that implies either good, excellent, or fair um, uh, 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 presence or, or distance. <coughs> and then I said, okay, well, let's try this room. So here's a model of this room. Uh, I'm standing here, and these are five listening positions. And um, you can see that over here in the diagram for LOC, that it's actually very good. It's very good. It, it goes down from excellent to um, poor or, or fair, I would say, uh, over that distance. And if I play that, this is the one that's poor. To be suitable to the needs of modern concert music, a hall must accommodate a It's pretty good, actually. Um, and then this is the one that's in the middle. To be suitable to the needs of modern concert music, a hall must accommodate a great variety of styles. Music of the... Okay, and the one in front is just really sharp. Okay, I won't play that. So, um, I'm going to my conclusions. Uh, the human ability to instantly perceive that a sound source is near has been ignored by current uh, acoustic science, unfortunately. The neural mechanism and physics by which it works depend on the phase relationships of harmonics above a thousand hertz. And if you don't think that your computer's phase above a thousand hertz, Read the paper by Vile Polka in the November issue of the AES Journal, uh, where he lays that uh, <coughs> at rest and drives a silver stake through the heart. Um, anyway, uh, it's important. Um, there's, uh, and, and this evolved not just for measuring distance, but for the ability to separate harmonic signals into independent neural streams. That's what Siri needs to work, and it can't do it. There's substantial evidence that the perception of near has consequence for the ease of comprehension, ease of recall, and focusing attention, and I'd love people to prove me right or wrong. Okay. Um, too many reflections coming too soon destroys the sense of presence, the ability to localize, and the ability to separate sources. I can prove that in large rooms because I have the data, but not in classrooms. The ability to localize and separate sources is predicted reasonably well from a nose impulse response by the acoustic measure LOC. It's the only one I know that works at all. Okay. And that doesn't mean it's the best. Um, I challenge somebody to come up with a better one. I'm working on coming up with a better one. We'll see <coughs> who wins. We desperately need experiments to quantify the effects of LOC on comprehension and recall. And that's the end of my talk.